start in terms? Okay. So Garrett can explain a little bit when he make my say it again. So it's a randomized controlled trial of this internet-based intervention for sedentary adults. They compared it to a uh, commercially available, what do they call it? Uh, so th their particular one used uh, geographic mapping tools, a discussion of form, targeted social support, exercise videos, regular updates, and peer uh, physical activity progress. We then tested the efficacy of the enhanced program in relation to a publicly available website, standard internet websites, with 25 per group. And what they measured was the number of exercise minutes per week, pre and then post. So they have two groups. One group uh, gets this new focused internet intervention. The other group gets a regularly available website that they're supposed to go to. And they tested their exercise minutes per week beforehand. And then it's six months after they did it. They tested them before. To see they tested them before. So, and, then, the and then they then they tested them after to see. Um, actually, yeah, and they tested them after to just see how times. many. So just two, two times, yeah. Big two times after, one time. Uh, just one time. Well, so like baseline. But yeah, just before they start the intervention, they tested them exercise minutes per week, Pre and then they did post. Six months later, it was post. And you said they were measured in exercise minutes per yeah, week? Yeah, minutes per week. Okay. Like they had on 180. Well, starting point was like <laughs> pathetic. 18, <coughs> 18 minutes a week. So that's what they wanted to measure, how long they would Yeah, how, how much activity. So the groups were like 20 minutes a week or 18 minutes a week to start with, <coughs> and like 186 minutes a week after the intervention. Okay. 186 minutes is still only a couple hours a week. It's like daily exercise. Yeah, yeah it's three days. For much one better. Hour. Much better. And two people from UCSD on this study actually. Get enough of that, Nina, to hear it. Okay. Just to clarify, they're just measuring the increase after the intervention. Oh, well, they want to know if the two groups differed from pre to post. Oh, the two groups differed, not if. Yeah, they want to, because the control group that right. didn't improve as much. Not the same, but we're focused on. So, like, on the treatment group, the, the, the DD was the fault. The, uh, you're checking them. So. And both groups want to know whether their minutes per week went <laughs> up. They want to compare the two groups and how much their minutes per week went up. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Yeah.
So there's a husband and wife team, but the Geekle, the Glazer, Ron Glazer and Janice Geekle Glazer at Ohio State, who oh, she's a psychologist, he's an immunologist, and they've done the best work <coughs> on psychoneuroimmunology. Um, so this one was one looking at um, whether during a stress the antibodies for herpes virus is greater in people who had adverse childhoods than those who didn't. Got a pretty substantial difference between people who are reported having caught a lot of adversity in their childhood had much stronger antibodies for this, uh, for the EBV titer than people who didn't. So it actually showing a like a lifelong relationship between early childhood adversity and, <coughs> and the strength of your immune system. Pretty pretty clever way of doing it. They have to rate that to any person their own radar. And well, it is true, but they, they have scales that have been validated reasonably well, looking at uh, how well you can look at early diversity. You know, they, they're not quite as obvious. The questions aren't quite as obvious. And they, they've been validated by other things, looking at them, too. We did a study this time. Uh, then we're going to send you to the computers and have you do a confirmatory factor analysis using AMOS. So that's a little more complex than what we've done so far. <clears throat> that's the data we loaded. I think most of you have it loaded. If not, we'll send the thumb drives around. And I'm going to give you a little cheat sheet that takes you through it step by step in case you need that. All the book sort of does that, but it's a little bit long that way. And uh, look at my neat. Drawings are, <coughs> drawings are getting better. Uh, and then I'm going to do one. I'm going to do one for you. That's uh, a homework data sample. That's actually the answers are actually in the chapter 16, I think, 16B. So we'll do one, and then when you do your homework, you can match it to the answers in 16B. Um, so basically, I mean. You know, when you annotate it, you'll be able to copy from the book what they say about it. So you can at least show us you can do it. So, and that's a full-on structural equation model. Um, so the only difference between path analysis and structural equation modeling is we now allow latent variables to be put into the model. Latent variables are variables that are made up of other measured variables. <coughs> right, measured variables are a single entity that we measure. Latent variables are things that we are constructs that we put together based on a number of other measured variables. Usually at least two. And if there's only one, then it would be the same as the measured variable. Sometimes there's as many as six or seven. In order for the models to work, those those latent variables have to be decent latent variables, which is sometimes a problem. It may sound like they are, but then when you look at the numbers, they, they don't look like that. So it's basically doing a confirmatory factor analysis on the latent variables, and then putting that into a path analysis with any kind of combination of paths that you might want to use. The easiest one to do, what we're going to do, is one where we just look at a single measured outcome to measure. Uh, but you can also do things like uh, just a whole bunch of latent variables connected to each other, or you can have multiple outcomes. There's also something called latent class analysis where you can do this over time. It's more complicated still. We're not going to do those. You can actually look at how, the, how uh, a, a particular latent structure changes over time. <coughs> those are not going to be done. Is it ever a use? 
to uh, using a latent variable in your path analysis in Amos, would you ever explode that out graphically showing this is what made it up and here's what oh, yeah. we always do the weights are? Okay. Yeah, you always do that. Okay. You always do that. So that's what we're going to show you today. That's a, but it's essentially like this confirmatory factor analysis you guys are going to do with, I didn't name the three factors yet, just fact one, fact two, fact three, with each of them made up of six personality characteristics that we kind of found last time doing exploratory. So this is cheating because we're going to confirm something that we know is going to work because we've got it on the same data set, but this way we can just see how it works. So you always put these measures. Now in latent variables, you have the arrow going from the factor to the measure. So that's conceptually the idea is that you could think of it both ways, that well, this is made up of these. They want you to see this is actually not like a principal component anymore. This is a factor that actually is expressed through these measures. So there's some logic to why the arrows go one way versus the other, but I always thought it should go the other way myself. This seems like it should be made up of, it's just arbitrary. But they, you have to do it this way, it won't work. So yeah, you always have to put those in. Just to get a better understanding of it, why do you feel it should go the other way? Just I see it figure. Well, because I would think if you make up a notion like, um, Alexithymia is a construct. It's made up of three different measures. It seems like the measures go into it to make it up, not come out as an algorithm. But it's a different logic that's used for, for factor and versus principal component. So it, you just have to get used to it. Um, so there are some issues in the process of doing this. First thing is you specify the model usually with diagrams nowadays, so you can also do it with equations, but most of us would rather do diagrams than equations. <clears throat> Next thing we do is determine whether the, the, the model is identified, which means can the computer really derive a solution to it? And that gets a little bit more complicated, so let me come back to that one in a minute. Once you've determined whether it's an identified model, uh, you screen the data for the measures, missing data is a big problem, bad measures are a big problem, but those are something we're used to. Then you use some kind of computer system to do it. The most popular ones out there, the, the original most popular one is called Lyseral, it was a, prom, a program out of Sweden. So in the early days almost everyone was using that. And there was one that came out of uh, UCLA called EQS. Amos is one that uh, a guy named Arbuckle came up with that basically in conjunction with SPSS. So now it's used pretty widely. The gurus don't like it as much as they like uh, N plus or Lyseral, but it, the, the results are really close. So we have a guy here um, in IO, Dale Glazer, who's a total expert on SEM. He does consulting all over the world on it, writes articles on it. And he poo poos Amos because the differences are tiny little differences compared to the other ones. So, for most of us, we couldn't care less about that. It's going to be fine. Amos is much easier to use. M plus is a very widely used program, but it's a, um, all the rest of these, I should say, are actually not graphical interface programs. They're syntax programs. You have to actually learn the commands to make it do things. So, that means learning a whole bunch of new commands hard to remember so and one of my goals in life is to never learn any more syntax or anything <laughs> <laughs> something I had learned so darn many all of them give you uh, model fit parameter estimates <clears throat> consider equivalent models and tell you how to respecify the model if it doesn't work now there's a lot of danger to using structural equation model because you come up with something beautiful looking pictures that sort of make you look like you're modeling reality. But in fact, it, you're cap you could be capitalizing on chance. The constructs might not really be what you think they could be. So just because they're beautiful pictures doesn't mean it's a valid model. Uh, ultimately, what we try to do is really dig down and really see what the data is telling us and not just say, well, gee, this model has a decent fit, so it must really model what reality is. However, when it's used properly, it is a way of getting at very complex phenomena, which we are moving more and more towards in, in uh, 
psychologist, but as a clinical psychology, for trying to understand phenomena like pedophilia, like um, <coughs> uh, other kinds of psychopathology, like eating disorders. Um, these are very complex phenomena that we're never going to see one easy, even or even schizophrenia. So we now know that there is no gene for schizophrenia. We know it's got a genetic component. But the, an exhaustive search for any kind of even a couple of genes has turned up only vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. So there's like somewhere between half a dozen and a dozen genes that look like they're related to vulnerabilities in schizophrenia, but there's no such thing as a schizophrenia gene. And even in bipolar, there's only a small subset of bipolars that actually have a clear cut, where it's a clear cut genetic disorder. Uh, so when you see a clear-cut genetic disorder like Williams syndrome, Williams syndrome is a kind of a retardation similar to autism, there's two genetic um, signatures, and depending on which genetic signature the kid has, you can predict the symptoms almost perfectly. So in the most severe one, they're severely retarded and they're hypersocial. These are, this is a sad thing. These kids are sort of the opposite of autism in that they're hypersocial. They, they love everybody, they go up to everybody and talk to everybody, and therefore they're abused oftentimes because they would walk up to strangers and, and pedophiles prey on them. It's horrible. Uh, with, the, with the other genetic structure, they're hypersocial, but they're not so severely retarded. And so they, they and those are the kids that especially get, get uh, preyed on because they look kind of like normal kids and they come right up to you and look you in the eye and you think that you're wonderful. It's really quite an interesting group to work with. But there's a case where we really have a genetic signature. For things, for almost anything we would be interested in beyond that one, we're not finding genetic signatures. We're not finding it for ADD, not defining for schizophrenia, we're not finding it for most bipolar, we're not finding it for alcoholism. And we know there's a clear cut alcohol gene, you know, Mark, Mark Schuchter at the VA is a leading guy in the world on this. We can see the genetic links, but it's not so easy to see where they are, again, in vulnerabilities. So the genetic link is, is to uh, uh, how much relief you get from alcohol, how, how good it makes you feel. There's, there's a gene that seems to be related to that. So it's a very powerful drug. And if you, you know, you can kind of see this anecdotally, right? Because you can see it in my family. So my wife is of Irish descent, my father's from Ireland. And if one glass of wine is good, she would love to have a second glass of wine. She doesn't, but she would love to have a second glass of wine. After one glass of wine, I, I'm done. I, there's no interest to me in having that second glass of wine. You have to force me to be able to do it. And clearly there's a genetic difference, and that's been true. When I was a college kid, I hung out with a lot of drinkers, and I tried to become a drinker just to be with them. I couldn't do it. I mean, they get up in the morning and go have a beer, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> so there are these strong genetic differences and some things like that. But anyway, so those are the, so the problems that we're interested in are not going to be simple answers like that. They're not going to be signatures that we're going to see. So we end up having to kind of use these complex models. So remember, we, we I think we've done this already. Squares mean measured variables. Ovals mean latent variables. Circles mean error. Sometimes they're called disturbances, and some, some books call them disturbances, sometimes errors, sometimes residuals. Um, if you have no path, then you can use the same kinds of things for confirmatory factor analysis. Directional arrows mean one thing going to another, double sided arrows mean correlations. Those are the rules we've talked about. All right, so this is kind of a complicated one for identification. But when you're coming up with a model, you need to be able to do this. So you have to have as many observations as free model parameters. So uh, the way the book defines this is, I like the kind of way they do it. They call known, known quantities versus unknown quantities. You have to have at least one more known quantity than an unknown quantity for the model to be identified. Um, so they're usually called observations and parameters. You have to have a little bit more observations and parameters. 
easiest way to do it is to look at the example. And this one's a past example, but it doesn't matter. It would be just as true. So let's say, uh, this is one we're going to look at uh, before. Notice these people do use disturbances for these. So let's say we're looking at a model of illness related to exercise, hardiness, fitness, and stress. Okay, so you're trying to see how do those things go together. In this model, pretty much everything goes together. We're saying hardiness and exercise are correlated. Exercise directly decreases illness, but it also works by way of increasing fitness, which decreases illness. Uh, and also, exercise decreases stress, which decreases illness. That's this path. And then we say hardiness directly decreases illness. The more hardy you are, the less illness you have. But also, the more hardy you are, the less stress you have, or the less stress affects you, and then the stress to illness again. And hardiness also seems to, I think, affect fitness. I think we've connected everything together. It's kind of, how does the hardiness affect fitness? I, get the, I guess the, model, the, the theory is that the, the people who have trait hardiness are more likely to be fit, are more likely to take care of themselves and be fit. It could be wrong, but let's say that's the hypothesis. That'd be the function of how soon you quit the workout, too. Yeah, it could be. It could be. I mean, it could be wrong. I mean, I don't like that one either, but just let's start with the sure. okay. So to get the observations, you can either count or you can actually use this little formula, which is the number of variables times the number of variables plus 1 divided by 2. So in this case, there's five variables. So we have 5 times 6 is 30 divided by 2 is 15. That's what counts as the number of observations in this model. Well, what's the two? Uh, why is it divided by two? It's just it's an arbitrary. Oh, so it's just, just, it's just the way to make it. You can also get that by just counting basically everything in there. You'll get 15 things, all the lines, boxes, and disturbances. You'll get 15 things. But this was an easier way to do it. OK, now, that's how many observations. But how many parameters are there? Well, parameters are a little more complicated. Parameters are the, the unknowns, basically. And here's how we can one, two, three, four. Well, this is to get the 55, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. This is my PowerPoint skills. <laughs> So that's how. That's also how we can get the fifty. The uh, the eleven and twelve. Why does that count? From eleven and up, I didn't see how those last five work. Yeah, that's the disturbance. The the, the the error disturbance term. Oh, that's counting. Those count too. Okay. So for parameters, you count the exogenous variables, the disturbances the errors. So there's two exogenous variables, right? Two exogenous variables. Exercise and hardiness. Disturbances, three. Fitness, oops, it's supposed to be fitness, illness, and stress. It does just purely exogenous because they're in stress and fitness, they're still exogenous, but they're also in. No, if anything has zeros going two of them, no, don't count as exogenous. Oh. Just, just arbitrary. So then if we go to the number of disturbances, oops, you can see we have fitness, illness, and stress all have disturbances. Fitness, stress, illness, and disturbances. We count those. We count the number of covariances, exercise and hardiness. So those, those lines. Um, and the direct effects of nine arrows for the direct effects, right? So there's nine direct arrows. One, so it's just an here. One two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So there's nine direct arrows. 
So we end up with the total of those being also 15. So we have what's called a just identified model, where the observations of the parameters are the same. And sometimes you, sometimes those will run and sometimes they won't. You really want to have, so the degrees of freedom is the number of observation minus parameter. You want to have at least one degree of freedom in almost most models. So um, this, this last, this measure that we added them all up, you're calling that parameters, mm -hmm. even though that other category we're calling parameters as well. No, the other one, the top one is observations. Everything below that are Yeah, the second one. Yeah, I'm sorry. The, those actually should be underneath it. Those oh. are all. Those are all under parameter. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So those exogenous variables, when even though exercise and hardiness were correlated, yeah, that doesn't so matter. That doesn't matter. Yeah, okay. Okay. You just count the, You just count those as the two things are being correlated as well. Gotcha. Okay. And what's the degree of freedom again? Number of observations minus number of parameters. So in this case, we. You want it to be greater observations and parameters, otherwise you don't have a degree of freedom. So in this case, we probably should have taken that arrow out that I was worried about, taking out the hardiness to fitness one, and then we would lose one of those, and that would give us um, one degree of freedom. It'd be a better model. And you said it was called a just identified model because the Because they're equal. If they're exactly equal, it's just identified. If, it's, if, there's more, if there's more parameters and observations, it's over-identified, and the computer won't run it. It'll give you an error message. If it's, and if there's, not, if there's not very many, it could be under-identified, too. It's too simple of a model. Usually, it'll run. But you might sort of call that an under-identified model, where there's lots more, lots of variance unaccounted for, probably because there's not enough paths in it somewhere. So there's more observations than Parameters? Is that yeah, you want more observations of parameters, but they won't they, be under identified. Well, if you had way more observations of parameters, you say it could be under identified. Usually, you would say it's under identified when you're not accounting for much of the variance and you want to look at the models better. And the and the Amos will give you some parameters that tell you, uh, give you some output that tells you which which paths would have helped you get better. It will identify potential paths. So if um, one of those paths would look good that we left out, it might say, hey, if you put that path in, that would be a pretty highly weighted path. But you can see the danger, because the next thing you know, you've got things that statistically look like they would fit, and now you say, oh yeah, that was my theory all along. So what you really have to do is respecify the model and retest it on a new sample, and do that a whole bunch of times. If you start getting really solid models that keep on repeating, you can then start to think that we may have really modeled, causal, causally modeled reality. In the meantime, all you got is really just, hopefully you got something, but it's pretty theoretical. So when you think about, even though it sort of seems free to put arrows to everything, it isn't actually free. You've got to be thinking about how those arrows work and the process. So a couple of examples you might be could look at notes maybe to see it better. Uh, here's, here's some real data on, the, on that illness one that we did. And as you thought, the pathway, the dotted pathways were not significant. So the top one are unstandardized weights. Some people like unstandardized weights because they're truly like raw regression weights, a so one unit increase in um, hardiness means a point 393 decrease in stress with everything else held constant going to stress. But usually people use standardized regression weights. And they're just sort of look at them as kind of like correlations. So you know the numbers between 0 and 1 usually, and they'll kind of tell you what's going on. So the way this one particularly worked out in a big sample was most of those dotted lines you can see didn't didn't pan out. The paths they got were basically from exercise to fitness to illness, from hardiness to stress to illness, and nothing else really. And even exercise and hardiness were hardly correlated at all. They weren't significant. So they had to end up with a very simple model if you take away those paths that were not significant. Now the paths that were significant were modest anyway at that, right? These are correlations of 
223, those were significant, but you know, what, if you want to think about that and square it, 0.223 is like 4% of the variance. And they're significant because they're dark? Because the, there's a full line there, yeah. You use a real line then. Professor, just conceptually, would you be able to describe uh, what they measured exercise with? Like, was it a number of times a week, or do you at all? Or? I don't remember. Okay. I'm sure that it's something like exercise minutes per week. Or. No, no, it wasn't dichotomous. None of these are dichotomous. So there's different issues when you have dichotomous measures. Now, so, I mean, the hardiness measure, I believe, was the Mad Salvador Maddy measure, and it was like a stress measure, it was like a checklist stress measure or something like that. And illness was, I think, self-reported illness of some kind. But you can see, here's a case where probably nothing too exciting about it, but it, that's how it would work. Once you get those, you get these goodness and fit measures that come out. I'll show you how to do those in a minute. Remember, chi-square, when the goodness of fit, the higher the chi-square, the worse the model. <clears throat> chi-square is a middle of measure of discrepancy. So whenever you get discrepancies between what you thought is going to happen and what really happened, that's not good. So, uh, but you can also use chi-square when you want there to be a discrepancy, like if you're doing uh, males versus females on two different, another dichotomous thing, and you want there to be a difference, and you, and you want there to be a significant chi-square. Um, so in any of these Goodness of fit measures, we'll have some more later in the semester. Uh, one of the ones that's quite often used is a root mean square of approximation, uh, error approximation. The lower that number, the better. Those are like significance numbers. So usually a rule of thumb is about 0.09 is, or lower is good. You rarely get them below 0.05 if you have a decent sized sample, but get them down into, into the single digits, that's pretty good. There's another one called the Comparative Fit Index, the CFI, where you want it to be above 0.9. And there's a zillion others. <laughs> the NFI, the NNFI, the PNFI. And this is because no one could really agree what the best fit measure should be. So there's this whole field of people that have their own favorites and put these out. So Amos pretty much gives you all of them because they're not sure which one's the best. Uh, but these two top ones, and then a couple of the other ones we'll show you later. The GFI, a lot of people use as well. Are, and usually they're, they're correspond to one another, but sometimes they're not, and then that's tricky when you don't know which one, which one to use. And you can use it for confirmatory factor analysis as well. Here's a couple of more that I think are a little bit better ones than the ones we just looked at. page is the one I just gave you. Then take a look at, I think this next one is actually the most interesting one of the ones. <clears throat> so this was a study on parental path uh, psychopathology and child abuse. <clears throat> and you can see, this one you'll be able to see a little bit better. Um, how it would work. The other one we had was a path. This is a truly a structural equation model. So what they did is they looked at um, adult externalizing behaviors, which is a, um, things like abuse. And we're going to do separate models for men and women. So the outcome in this one is a latent variable. How do they define adult externalizing behaviors? It was made up of 
a measure of adult antisocial behavior, drug dependence, and alcohol dependence. Right? So they're calling those three as one concept, adult externalizing behaviors. And you can always argue about that. Is that really a good way to do it or not? Then they looked at abuse as a concept and they used the child, child um, physical abuse and childhood sexual abuse as the two ways of doing that. There are pretty decent measures to get, uh, to get at that. So they, come, they considered abuse to be a construct based on those two. And then they had histories of whether the father exhibited externalizing behaviors. So father, FADA is, I remember these. Father antisocial personality disorder as well as father alcohol or drug dependence. So those two together can constituted father externalizing disorder. And then for the mother, they use the same things. Mother, um, is that right? Mother externalizing behavior. Um, I think it's the same too, right? It's the same. Yeah. So it's mother. Uh, antisocial and mother, um, I don't know, let's see, MAPC is what's that one? It says below there, I just have to find it. Okay. A person, yeah. That one's not listed on there, is it? The MAPC? MAPD. Mother antisocial. Yeah. Oh, it's MAPD. No. Mother antis. It's the same as the father. Right, right, right. Okay, so the first thing to look at is how well did those latent variables work? All right. So for adult externalizing, the, the three weights, those are like loadings. Those are like factor loadings. So that worked pretty well. 0 0.76, 0 0.54, and 0.66. Seems like you've got a viable latent variable for AEX. AEXT, yeah, right? <coughs> Those are, and uh, looking at the little numbers of the arrows going from AEXT to AAB, DD, and AD. 0 0.76, 0 0.56, 0.56, 0.54, 0.66. Now, one thing you need to know is if you don't get a good latent variable, you really can't continue. I mean, you're not, what are you measuring if you don't get? three things that go together with that. So we had a dis sort of disastrous dissertation some years ago where uh, the student was got access to a big data set out of the University of Michigan that did a longitudinal study of kids' um, activity levels contributing to obesity, a million factors contributing to obesity and, and a very large group of kids and a representative sample out of uh, this social research thing in Michigan. So we put together, we got a hold of that data, and we put together what we thought would make a lot of sense in terms of latent variables, like child sedentary behavior would be a lot of TV watching, mm -hmm. a lot of game playing, um, lack of exercise, it didn't work. <laughs> kids, some of the kids exercised a lot who also watched TV at time. I mean, it just didn't. So when we got to put together this whole beautiful little diagram, the first step of the diagram is to find good latent variables that didn't work very well. We had to kind of go back and just use specific variables for those and try to make the best out of them we could. And really, when we ended up, we didn't, it didn't make a whole lot of sense, honestly. We didn't really find out a lot about what contributes to childhood obesity. Because we had real valid ways, weights for kids at age 8 and at age 13. So you think, well, gee, it would be really good to know what predicts weight gain from age 8 to age, to age 13 but it didn't very well. We found a few things. Okay, uh, abuse is fine, except it looks like sexual abuse is a little bit low of a weight. So that's a little worrisome, although those two just make so much sense, it's probably okay. Are these beta weights? Or? Yeah, they're like beta weights. Yeah, these are beta weights. 
And then the, but the father externalizing worked well, and so did the mother externalizing. Those were really good size weights, right? So then they put together the model based on that, and they said, okay, they also had another one, parental absence or presence, that was a measure of variable yes or not. Was, was there, was there a, uh, an absent parent in the home? Um, so you can see that that by itself actually didn't contribute very much, right? The starred ones are the significant ones. So you can see the decent sized weights were from mother externalizing behavior to adult, to current adult externalizing behavior, but that was only 0.15. The, the correlation between father, father and, and absent was very high. So guess what? The father was the absent member usually, right? <clears throat> so that's why that correlation came out pretty high. That 0.41 is between FEXT and parental absence. So at least we're controlling for parental absence that way. You know? Parental absence had no relationship to abuse, which probably makes some sense. Mother externalizing did relate to abuse, but father externalizing really related to abuse. So that's that one. But then, from abuse to, uh, to the current adult abuse was actually significant, but a pretty low weight, 0.19. Only 15% of the variance in, in AEXT was accounted for. See the little number 0.15 above it? So 85% of the variance in the current adult externalizing behavior, that is their drug use, their alcohol use, and their antisocial behavior, only 15% of that was accounted for by these other factors, which isn't really a lot. <coughs> Significant, but it's not a lot. Which other factors? Well, everything, everything in the equation. The yeah, exactly. Okay. So, but you know, that seems like a reasonable attempt here. I mean, if you're going to look at um, these externalizing behaviors, which are really an important thing for psychologists to look at, these are people that are not doing well in life. How do, you, how do you account for it? Most of us would say, well, yeah, you know, you've got a psychopathic mother and an absent father, and that and the father abused you. That would explain it all, but it actually doesn't explain very much of it. People are really complicated. And then the mother model actually worked a little bit better for externalizing behavior in women um, because the weights were, some of them were decent size. For instance, the 0.39 between abuse and externalizing was really strong in women, much stronger. And it looks like most of that path is from father abuse and mother abuse, both, right? The mother abuse was 0.46, and father abuse was 0.35. And we explained 43% of the variance in CPA, CSA, so not surprisingly, if the mother and father were messed up, that was very likely the daughter was going to be abused. But then the path, the other paths really are pretty trivial, so that's the only real path that really accounted for very much of what was going on. And here we counted for 20% of the variance, which again seems very low. It's clinically when you run into adult women who are externalizing with these three behaviors. In my experience, they always have abuse histories. I mean, I don't know where, you just don't run into people who don't, but like this, who are, you know, abusing alcohol, abusing drugs, and kind of antisocial behaviors. So if you go into a women's prison, those women are all doing those three things. And if you do their histories, it's hard for me to believe that they don't have, they all have terrible developmental histories. Maybe they don't, doesn't show up this way. So. Margaret Mead always said that we make people have a license to drive a car, we should have make them have a license to have kids. Mm -hmm. It really makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Not easy to enforce, but... Okay, so well, that's one I think that works a little bit better, and then you can see there's a couple more here that are... They work pretty well, but they're made up of very fairly simple ones. There's a PTSD one on the other, other page here. <coughs> with... Uh, Seems kind of, it's 
kind of a silly one to me where you say you define physical and mental health functioning by physical health and mental health. Why don't you just do them separately? I don't know why you <laughs> decided to do that. Uh, however, here's, a good, here's good news. Look at the PTSD. This is, these are the four components of PTSD, avoidance, re-experiencing, numbing, and hyperarousal. Look how well they work. <clears throat> so this is a real progress. We've really made a lot of progress in PTSD by looking to see what are the components of them. These are the symptom components of PTSD that everybody's finding and have found, cross-culturally too. There's tons of Israeli studies, same exact kind of stuff. <clears throat> So that little latent variable, at least, is a really good latent variable. When we say PTSD, it has a meaning that really kind of works pretty well for us. And then you can look at the relationship to abuse for those, um, and there's pretty strong weights for all of those. <coughs> and those latent variables seem to work pretty well, especially the top one. Interesting how child sexual abuse is not significant, but then adult sexual abuse is. Yeah, right. Child, child abuse to PTSD directly doesn't work, but child sexual abuse, if you look at child non-sexual trauma and adult sexual abuse, those things, they work pretty well to PTSD. So yeah, that's, it is interesting. Yeah, no, they should actually. Those, I'm sure those are significant. I don't know why they're not. I think they just report them just so you know what they are. But they, most people would put an asterisk on those. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Clearly, a 0.59's got to be significant, right? Right. A 0.43 is. Although those are just straight correlations, so they're not controlled for anything, but um, they still have to, 0.59 has to be So generally when you're creating a model, you I always would put an asterisk in there. Okay. Yeah, I guess some people don't, but they didn't. No, they didn't in the other ones either, so. Yeah, they did in the other one. Mm -hmm. The point, point 0.43 they did. My experience is that they do, I don't know why they didn't. So they reformulated this model based on their first model. This is they, they, they respecified it a little bit, took away the path from adult, anything else, took away from child sexual abuse, basically everything running through P PTSD. Probably the most the interesting thing is, I mean, it doesn't seem to be very meaningful that PTSD loads on physical and mental health. Me. If you stop the model right there, then that's kind of more interesting. You just take it away from that part. But you can see that those work pretty well. And whenever you see something like a construct like that, that's really where you make your heart beat faster when you see concepts like that. That work so well. And then the other one, is there one we can talk about? No, I think that's all. Oh yeah, there's another one on another one. All right, so you got the idea anyway. So let's go ahead to the computers. We'll do this. We'll do this first one before the break. And what you want to do? Let me give you this one. How can we tell if they have AMS on our computer? Just computer analyze. We don't have the very bottom. I don't think we have it on the No, we don't. Have to pay extra for it. So see if you can set up this confirmatory factor analysis with these various features. Also, I put a concept list in the back of that when I hand out. Yeah, I 
Chapter 19, the file is in the Sage, Sage Pub, you know, the site where you're getting your files. It's called Academic Performance. And the model is um, four latent variables. Against one measured variable, GPA. And what they're trying to do is an academic determining academic performance by a link variable called encouragement and one called efficacy and one called commitment this is a weird name for it actually and one called social So this is uh, like child, like a relative support, parent support. You'll see what the variables are that lead to them. This is how good the school is. Social is like fraternities and social life. And commitment is uh, some, not what it sounds like. I'll, I'll find it in a minute. And they, they, they postulated this model. So we're kind of doing what we just did, but now we're going to use the same same idea to look at the um, kind of structural equation model. When we put it all in, it's going to look like books are too heavy to carry around. around I guess it's going to look like that. What page is that? Nine nine three. <coughs> So now this one's including all the latent variables, all the variables to make up the latent variables, which I'm going to put in right now. You'll see them. And that's what we have to do for our homework. Yeah, that's what. And then, then the answer is in the, in the chapter B here. So you can actually look and see how you, you can get them to match. And it kind of describes all the results of modification in the C's. It, it changes the model, does it again, fixing up the model. So you can see how you really do one. And you can compare yours to theirs by actually using this particular data. And it's a big data set, so it kind of works. So if I put this in, I'm going to do uh, one. Yeah. Oh, my goodness, I'm doing this too. Okay. This is what some of the computers did this to us. Get my variables. 
Okay, so this one is parents, role, and relatives of the variables. Parents, role, and relatives. These actually are in good order to do this. And this one is reputation programs and ranking. Reputation programs and ranking. I don't know why they call that commitment. That seems strange to me, but all right. And this one is succeed intellect and writing. Clubs, Greek, and Office. Clubs. Clubs. Yeah, I got that as well. Where do these extra boxes just pop up? Yeah, that's no good. You get the like, I did something wrong. Make sure you get rid of them. steps that they do in here and get a, you know, this is not a super kind of complicated one, but it's a real structural equation model with a big, with a big uh, sample. So I'm, I'm hoping to go through both of them. 